Perfect. Well, as people are, uh, continue to filter in, I'm going to sort of get us started so that way we can stay on time and uh, have plenty of time for for this this amazing panel that we have. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eric Wagner. I'm uh, honored to be uh, hosting this with uh, Dr. Chris Clifto. And even more, we're both really honored to have um, uh, three outstanding experts, as you, as, you, as you can imagine, in the field of, of children in general, but especially especially in the uh, field of shoulder arthroplasty. Um, so doctors uh, Jason Jason Zhu, J Jonathan Levy, and Joaquin Sanchez Sotel, many of you know them from, from their phenomenal teaching, their expertise, their papers that have changed how we think about this stuff. But hopefully now you'll get some insights into how they think about some of the more challenging things that we, we face in, in shoulder arthroplasty. Um, but before we sort of get going, we do want to play a video from Smith and Nephews. They were gracious enough to sponsor this uh, program and uh, and sponsor the Journal Club. At Smith and Nephew, we strive to put solutions in your hands that can allow your patients to live a life unlimited, and the shoulder space is no different. Here at Smith & Nephew, our focus is on providing you options throughout your patient's continuum of care with cutting-edge products like Regenitin, a bioinductive implant that redefines biologic healing for rotator cuff tendon growth, and the new Atos Shoulder System, starring the Atos Metastem, that allows for maximized stability and an elevated surgical experience with an efficient system to help simplify shoulder surgery. We are honored to support the ASDS Foundation, and it is our mission to continue to provide you with the most innovative solutions in the shoulder to help restore the patient's ability to live their life unlimited. Awesome, Chris, you want to kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for those of you online, if you're watching this live, if you have any questions, send them in the chat, in the chat box and, and we could ask the experts or you could message me directly if you want to uh, be anonymous, but um, let's make this fun and interactive and let's get going, we'll have a good time. So. The first paper is called is titled "The uh, Predictors of Dislocations After Reverse Shoulder Arthroplasty," a study by the ASES Complication Group, which is a multi-center research group. So, this study sought to determine the incidence and patient risk factors for dislocations after RSA using a large multi-center cohort with varying implants. This was a retrospective multi-center study involving 15 institutions and 24 ASES surgeons across the United States. Inclusion criteria consisted of patients undergoing primary revision RSA between 2013 and 2019, with a minimum of three-month follow-up. Dislocations were defined as complete loss of articulation between the humeral component and the glenosphere and required radiographic confirmation. Binary logistic regression was performed to determine patient predictors of dislocations after RSA. The U had over 6,000 patients which met inclusion criteria and a mean follow-up of 19.4 months, 40% were male with an average age of 71 years. The rate of dislocation was 2.1% for the whole cohort and 1.6% for primary RSAs and 6.5% for revision RSAs. Dislocations occurred at a medium of seven weeks after surgery with 23% occurring after a trauma. Patients were primary diagnosis of glenohumeral arthritis with an intact rotator cuff had the lowest dislocation rate. Patient predictors of dislocations were history of post-operative subluxations before radiographic confirmed dislocation, primary diagnosis of fracture nonunion, revision arthroplasty, and a primary diagnosis of rotator cuff uh, disease, male sex, and no subscapular repair at surgery. So this study concluded the strongest patient-related factors associated with dislocation were a history of post-operative subluxations and having a primary diagnosis of fracture nonunions. RSAs for osteoarthritis show lower rates of dislocations than RSAs for rotator cuff disease, and male sex and no subscapularis repair a surgery were also associated. So maybe uh, for Joaquin, so, you know, we all see patients that come in who that complain of uh, subluxations. How do you manage these patients based on the data? Are you going to take them back to revise them or do you observe them? Yeah, I had already observed that in my practice and I think Bob Tashian was the first person to point it out in the uh, medical literature. And uh, I don't revise them at that point, but I do counsel them that I'm worried that eventually they're going to end up dislocating. And this paper uh, shows very powerfully that the OS ratio was close to 20, you know, 20 times more likely to dislocate. So there was a time where I tried to almost brush it off and tell patients, oh, you're feeling something funny, but it's not 
a real problem and now I actually worry about it. And when they start to tell me, ah, oh, my shoulder feels like it's coming out of place, I tell them, well, it's probably coming out of place and what they may dislocate. I just haven't found it complain enough for me to tell them you must have a revision because not every patient that has this feeling of subluxation, which is very subjective, will end up dislocating. Yeah, but I, so I, I kind of handle that a little bit differently, Joaquin. I used to I used to be that way. I used to be pretty dogmatic, like unless you truly dislocate, I'll not I won't revise you because I can't prove that you're actually doing it. But I, I've kind of I've swung the other way. Uh, I think people who are feeling unstable don't like it. They have this odd sensation and they they don't have a confidence. It's like apprehension, right? If you have if you're going to continue to dislocate or subluxate in your native shoulder, you're you're probably more likely to want that operation. So I've gone, I've gone the other way. And, and I tell people, patients, like, if this is a real problem for you, the revision is, and you can go into that, but you know, it, it's a generally actually of all the revisions we do, and this is one of the more straightforward ones. So it's not as intimidating, not that any revision should be, you know, sold as a, as a primary, but it can be a much simpler, especially if you have modular junctions that are easy to revise. It's a pretty straightforward revision with a pretty, you know, a reasonable success rate if it's in this situation, right? If it's in a situation where, they're subluxating, they're not bone loss. It's just, you know, a situation that looks pretty manageable. So I, I kind of tell people, if, if this is a big enough problem for you, I'm ready to revise it when you are. One so thing that, John, would be that um, the papers that are published on doing what we could call a head aligner exchange for this location have not had a great success rate. So like Emily Chen published on people that were dislocating, she changed the sphere and the poly, and she had a 40% redislocation rate. So if I knew that a patient that is subluxing by just changing the sphere and then I'll make them stable, I would do it. But I'm not sure that in my hands I can confidently tell patients, you know what, I can make you stable 99% of the times. Do you feel that because you're getting to them before they dislocate, your success rate is higher? Because that's that's what I'm it's like, can I really make you stable or not? I don't know for sure. So I I mean. It, it might be system specific. And obviously I'm very conflicted with the DJ or nervous implant, but they have a 44 plus eight, right? So that's 44 millimeters steer and eight millimeters, a lot of less center rotation offset. And I think the combination of a very large steer and offset together, has, if I can fit it in, it's been a game changer for me. I think it's not hundred percent. I have a guy who continues to be unstable um, but that was a very different situation with bone loss. And, and, and you know, when I'm in this situation, and, and what I take away from this paper actually is the highest at-risk group that I deal with as primaries um, are really the large cuff tear arthropathy patients. So the males that are large, that don't have a ball humeral head. And I actually start by thinking I'm going to use a larger sphere and I'm going to put them a little bit tighter, anticipating that those are going to be the problem patients. And if then they dislocate, they usually have plenty of space to get a 44 in. And, and that those are the only primaries I've had real instability problems with, but I haven't had, I should knock on wood, but I, I've had a, a decent um, success rate using that large sphere. And, and I'm not, you know, those might be a role for even a bigger uh, sphere in, in those cases that, that are continuing to be unstable. So Levy, yeah. when you, when you talk about this, uh, so are you, you're talking about enlarging the sphere. So when you do the sublux, when patients are subluxing, you're enlarging the sphere. How about the ones that come in dislocating? Are you are you changing? Are you are you doing the same thing, or are you are you doing it slightly different because maybe it's a little bit more severe? Are you are you? In so that, it, it it gets into the why, right? And so, a great paper that I was a part of was Frankel's classification system, where it talks about the origins of the different reasons for people having dislocations. And if there's a paper that I think you should read as it relates to understanding instability, it's that. Um, but if you understand if it's a bone loss, let's say there's a lot of proximal humor bone loss, you have to strategically not just deal with the sphere, you need to deal with the bone loss on the proximal humerus, create the deltoid wrap, uh, if you will. Um, but I almost always am trying to use a, a larger sphere as part of that. And then I will tension on the humeral side, or depending whether I need to add, add bone or add something else to, to restore that. But definitely... Usually it's it's doing something on both sides. It's not just one side. People think, oh, it's unstable. I'll just put a constrained liner like a hip. That's not the answer. I think you got to go larger with the ball and then tension on the sphere on on, on the on the uh, on the humeral side. Yeah, I agree with uh, John here. I think all the data in this study kind of points to the fact that you know you, or reverse, you really have to take the cuff status into consideration. If you have a big cuff tear, especially if there's no subscap, I repair the subscap every time go bigger, go lateral on the glenosphere, because um, you just don't have 
you know, much compression. And so even in the revision setting with proximal humeral bone loss, you go bigger on the glenosphere. Uh, same as John, I'm, I'm conflicted, but I love that 44 plus eight, uh, especially in the bigger males, you, you can go with a 40 glenosphere, but some of these big, you know, they have a lot of, you know, their osseous structure is just large. So sometimes a 40 glenosphere just isn't enough. So um, I agree. I, I usually go big on the glenosphere side first. And then uh, I do oftentimes use a deeper liner to provide more stability. And it's really important though, you, if you use a deeper liner, you have to make sure that you're ensuring that on the glenoid side that you you make sure there's no bony or soft tissue impingement. I think another common thing uh, that I've seen for revisions for surgeons that are not as experienced is that the posterior inferior glenoid bone is not resected adequately. And if you get some medial impingement when you externally rotate or when you adduct. And so it's really critical. Oftentimes we're putting retractors back there and we're not as particular about looking at the posterior infrared glenoid, I think a big part of prevention is preventing bony impingement in that area. And then, Jay, I would say it's, it's not just, it's not even just bone alone. It, it's soft tissue. Like you can get a big, thick, thick part of the capsule. It's just, it's five millimeters thick. And if you don't cut that out, you're going to have asymmetric tightness and it'll just spit out because you haven't released the back. So it's more than just bone, but you're absolutely right. It's ironic. Like here you're doing a revision for instability. I'm doing huge releases. Huge yeah. releases around the glenoid. So it seems yeah. counterintuitive, but I think you need to. But especially this comes to the point of a revision surgery. Like if you're revising like a, a hemi or an anatomic, oftentimes there's this huge scar ball inferior, and you got to just find the nerve and you got to resect all that tissue out of the way because you're you're dropping that humeral humerus down. And like John said, it, it's soft tissue too. So uh, that's really a critical point of uh, stability and reverses. Jason, so talk to talk to me. The high risk patient, um, uh, the the male cuff tear uh, arthropathy um, that uh, doesn't have a subscap. So, so you said larger glenoid sphere. How are you telling the tension? How are you how are you putting it quote unquote tighter? Like what, maybe talk to the fellows about uh, about your 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 workflow and technical tips. So one of the biggest things that I take in town is just the subscap. If you have a subscap that you can tie down. Regardless, almost regardless of what the posterior and the superior cuff uh, status is, almost always you'll get enough compression that it should be stable. But so if I'm if I'm missing a subscap, I'm automatically going up in glenosphere sizing. After that, a lot of it is a little bit of uh, a feel thing. You know, I I do put you know I I do a lateral shuck. Uh, I try to feel to see make sure that uh, there's no impingement and there's not too much looseness going laterally. And I take the arm through an entire range of motion and just make sure there's no bony impingement. And uh, I do not, especially if there's no cuff or subscap, I don't want to easily uh, lateralizing when I'm kind of pulling lateral on either the poly or the arm itself from the axilla. Beautiful. All right, Joaquin, I'm going to guess you on a, uh, or ask you on an even harder one. So they mentioned in this paper, uh, non-unions are one of the more challenging, or sorry, malunions are one of the more challenging ones that we have to uh, deal with. Can you uh, talk to us about how are you approaching these these non-unions or malunions in the uh, post-traumatic setting, and and some things that you get you found that are nice pearls to prevent this complication? Yeah, that's a great question. If you are look at the paper that the uh, French uh, group published, you know, Patrick Reich was the first author. They published on primary reverse for non-union. They had a 34% dislocation rate. If you read the methods, some of those surgeries were actually amputating the tuberosities, but some were fixing them. And uh, I thought we were better. So we just looked at the outcome at Mayo and we have a 12% dislocation rate in non-unions, you know, all comers. And uh, what I have migrated to do is to have a lower threshold to use an APC or a tumor prosthesis and be very careful about tuberosity repair as infractures, basically. So if I realize that the tuberosities are so poor and the calf so retracted that I cannot get them to unite, then I go to an APC or a tumor prosthesis. And we had maybe one of every 10 of our patients in the study will be publishing in GSCS require that type of reconstruction. And even then, we have a 12 percent dislocation rate. So that, that. So the patient, we all see this patient, right? The patient has a surgical neck fracture, has very thin tuberosities, went on to non-union. And we all wonder, do we do a, a, a tumor prosthesis? Do we do the APC for that super proximal non-union? You're going to an APC at this point? 
It depends a little bit on um, how the patient uh, looks like to me. If it's extremely old and frail, I will do a tumor prosthesis. But if uh, if a patient has reasonable life expectancy, I will do an APC because I like to repair the calf to the allograft. So I like to use an allograft with soft tissue, and I will basically uh, enucleate the tuberosity and fix the tendon to tendon uh, posteriorly and then anteriorly as well. Any role for osteotomies and repairs of tuberosities in those patients? You you can try. The problem is that if it's very chronic, sometimes it doesn't really reach. Uh, a couple of tricks are to detach the supra, so that you're only pulling on infrantelis minor. That will give you some excursion. And to do an intraarticular capsulectomy posteriorly to gain excursion. But even then, if it's been two or three years, I have found that getting the bone to heal is difficult. And it's also more thick, so it's difficult to make it fit around the allograft. Whereas if you have an allograft with tendon graft, you're gaining some length in your allograft tendon, and you don't have to go all the way over to do a rotator calf repair to the graft. So my go-to is an allograft with tissue and then a primary repair of the rotator calf of the patient. Very nice. All right. We're going to move on to the next one so we can stay on time. Um, and just as a, a plug for prior journal clubs that are available on the website, the article that Levy mentioned was one of the topics of one of the prior journal clubs we did last year. So please go to the website. We have a great discussion uh, with Frankel on that uh, instability, great instability paper. So, all right, we're going to convert to, uh, we're going to go to the one looking at positive and negative CACNES results by the ASES multicenter PGI group. But uh, we are honored to have the corresponding author join us on this. Um, this is a very relevant topic. You know, as you know, CACNES is something that we are constantly talking about, constantly trying to learn more about, both with regards to interpretation of positive and negative results and what to do with them. The purpose of this was to look at the accuracy of CACNES using positive and negative controls, as well as time to culture positivity and strength of culture positivity. It's a really novel uh, uh, methodology. So basically isolated the, uh, isol they got isolated from a humeral canal of a patient who grew five out of five um, positive cultures for CACNES, and then um, cultured it and prepared multiple dilutions that were sent off, um, as well as negative samples from a piece of gauze. They ultimately included 11 institutions, so 110 positive samples um, and, uh, and 22 negative samples. So each institution received 10 positive, two negative. The um, different dilutions uh, were, were also sent as, as part of the 10 positive and um, each institution handled it as if they'd received it from the operating room. So ultimately the highest dilutions of free axis acnes were 100% positive the lowest dilutions had a 91% positive positivity and the negative samples had a 14% positivity. So it had a nice spread that they could do some uh, stats and found that the um, those that had uh, that, that had C-acnes <clears throat> grew that they were positive for C-acnes, actually grew samples within an average of four days, all grew within seven days. And that time to positivity, so how long it took to become positive, as well as strength of positivity, were higher for the positive cultures compared to the false positive cultures. And ultimately, this increased time to positivity was, was associated with a decreased um, uh, density. So this is sort of like reinforcing that uh, not only is a positive culture important, but, it, but the time to when it became positive and the strength of positivity is really relevant a very great multi-center study, um, obviously a lot of value in doing this type of study in that fashion. It has a lot of more broad applicability. So it gives us some insight into these true and false positives that we often will see and often deliberate on what to do with them. Also potentially is helping us to understand these PGIs related to C-acnes and, and maybe better understand how to both diagnose and treat them. So Jason, maybe do you want to give us some insight into this that I didn't cover or insight further into your thoughts, your thinking, kind of how this is, is changing? Yeah, sure. Just a little background on the study. We designed it when we first started the ASES multi-center groups, and there was all this data coming out about false positives, one out of Duke that uh, Greg Gary said sh showing alarming false positive rates. So we thought it'd be interesting just to send a clinically relevant sample, make replicates, and see what different institutions reported. And, and so uh, we were really interested in what the false positive rates that were at different institutions and also It'd be uh, it allow us to be more confident in future studies looking at cultural results from different institutions. So the fun part was every institution was blinded, so they had no idea whether it was negative or positive. And so it was uh, it was um, it was fun to see the results. But I, I think the most poignant results are you know you pointed them out. The first is that false positives are definitely a concern. So 
in this study was 14%, which matches to most of the literature. And I think it's important for every institution to kind of know what their uh, false positive rate is. But I think the big deal here is trying to figure out when you get a positive culture, what's a false positive or what's clinically relevant. And so the second thing is that a positive culture is not just positive or negative. You know, you you need to use other characteristics like time to positivity. I think uh, Ricchetti and Ainati have reported on that previously. And then uh, strength of positivity, a lot of uh, surgeons don't know, but the lab is always taking your sample and spreading it on a plate and looking at the number of quadrants that it grows on. And it, 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 I don't know whether every institution reports it that way when you get it in your EMR, but uh, you should look at that because once you get past the lowest level of positivity, you'll never have a false positive above. That. If it's above that first level, I would assume that's not a false positive. So um, I use that. I use this data personally. So I look at the. I try to, you know, get time to positivity, and then I definitely use the strength of positivity to uh, interpret my clinical results. So um, if it grows fast and it grew more, then it's more likely to be something clinically relevant. Um, I still think there's a question about clinical relevance and of, of positive cultures in general. That's a whole different topic. But uh, right now, I, don't, I just don't think we have the ability to determine which strains of cutie bacterium are pat cause pathologic changes, but that might be in the future in a few years or something like that. Yeah, no, no that's great. Um, Joaquin, on this topic of just trying to figure out who, who's infected or not, what do you do uh, if somebody shows up in the clinic, um, has a, pa a painful shoulder, and you're trying to rule out that they have an infection? Um, what, what's your what's your workup? How do, how do you make the decision? Let's say there's no draining. There's nothing draining from it. Um, it's just pain. You know, arthroplasty was maybe a year or two ago. Some, something sort of relatively nonspecific. How do you uh, how do you how do you rule rule out that they have an infection? Yeah, that's a great question, Eric. Um, so, provided that there is no other explanation for pain, so implants look well fixed, there is no loosening, and so on, I still send my patients for an aspiration, uh, and I do it for two reasons. Number one, all the false results of aspiration are on C acne, which is about sixty percent of infections, but not one hundred percent. So, if a patient has a staphylococcus or uh, you know other bacteria, you may get lucky and get it. And if you know it in advance, it can really help you plan the surgery. Um, and the second reason is research. If we never take cultures on all commerce, we can never calculate specificity, sensitivity, and so on. So I do an aspiration. Blood work I get, but I don't trust it as much. And then I am in the camp of doing arthroscopic biopsies for those patients where I have really no clue of what's going on. But it's a very small number because that's the patients where I really cannot figure out what's going on. And I don't use a bone scan in my practice. I don't know about others, but I don't. Yeah, Levi, do you have anything uh, anything different? So what, how do you approach these patients that maybe doesn't have an obvious reason for pain or or um, or, or some of the early, early symptoms, but um, it isn't draining, isn't obviously infected? Yeah, it's ironic. So today I did a arthroscopic biopsy on a patient who had a normal sed rate in CRP and well-fixed total shoulder, because I don't know why he was he was hurting. And I had a patient with a loose humeral stem from a reverse after a failed reverse for fracture. So a loose humeral stem, which clues you in for infection. Sed rate in the ESR through the roof. And I can tell you in surgery, it didn't look infected. So uh, literally two extremes of, of how I approach him. But I, I, I don't, you know, for a younger patient who I don't want to ever in a situation where I have them on suppressive antibiotics for life, uh, I'll typically do a, a scope biopsy to try to look for reasons for, for pain. And sometimes you find, like today, I found a loose glenoid. It didn't look loose on x-ray or CT, but intra-op, I can move it. So you can learn more from just than just getting the biopsies. You actually can learn a little bit more about the, the pathology. So um, I don't do aspirations. Um, I'm worried about getting a positive theacnes that's a false positive, and then I'm got to do a lot more than I really want to to that patient. And uh, so I make the decisions based on clinical symptoms, identifying problems, and I will use an arthroscopic biopsy to help me make that sort of break of decision. Maybe we could go down the line. Dr. Duraldi was kind enough to join us tonight. He had a question. Does anyone use frozen sections at the time of surgery to help rule the infection? Maybe we could start with Joaquin, John, and Jason. I do. I do get a frozen uh, uh, section. If they are negative, they don't, I don't really count them in, but if they are positive, I think twice. So for me, a positive value 
makes me think if it's negative, I still know the patient could be infected. But again, it's also for research. If you don't have the negative results, you can never really know what's your sensitivity and predictive values and so on. So I do get them. So Joaquin, it makes you think twice, but, but what are, are you thinking twice about then proceeding with the revision? Are you doing a single stage exchange where you're washing, um, doing more, or are you doing a two stage when you get that positive intraoperative? You know, at Mayo, we have had an ongoing fight with our ortho ID colleagues to do one stage and they convince them otherwise. So if we think it's infected, it's two stage for us, unfortunately. I want to change that, but I have been unsuccessful. So if I am on the fence, meaning it looks funny, and on top of that, pathology is positive, I will bail out. But it's not just because of pathology. So it's one more factor, but I use it in my decision making, but it's one of many factors. How does it look? Is it an explained loosening and things like that? Vivi, what about you? Do you use it? I, I don't. I got I, I read in my in my old location, I, I got tons of uh this is an acute on chronic uh with I can't get good numbers, I can't get a good answer from the pathologist. And to be honest, the last, the last time I sent a, a, a histology, it came back cancer and it created this whole workup. It ended up not being cancer, thank God. But I just, it, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to do it. Uh, I, I'm not trusting of, of like, it, I, I don't have a situation like Mayo or Cleveland Clinic or even Seattle where you have just phenomenal pathologists that are just geared towards orthopedics. And I think that matters. So in the community, uh, I'm not using it. Jason, what about you? Yeah, I get frozen section, but like Joaquin, I think it, I do it mainly for research. And so the multi-center group that did this paper also looked at, uh, is looking at frozen sections and everyone's doing frozen sections. And the data that we have is not really supportive of it, honestly. But if you look at the ROC curves, the AUC is like 0.6 of the diagnostic, uh, it, it's not really that great. So um, I 100% I agree that being consistent with workup, especially infection, is important so that you can study it. For people in private practice, in terms of how much you test, I think it is very dependent on whether it's going to change your management. I'm a big single stage exchange guy, so I don't test a lot. So it's not going to change what I do. If I get a positive culture, if I get a negative culture, I'm, I'm almost always going to do a single stage exchange unless it's like pussing out. So uh, I honestly don't test a lot. I don't do a lot of arthroscopic biopsy. I don't do a lot of aspirations. But um, you know, I think uh, everyone's threshold for one stage versus two stage is different. And if you are very conservative and you want to go two stage, then more testing is going to help you out before surgery. Jason, a couple of questions for you. Um, do you place all your revisions on antibiotics for a couple of weeks? Until yes. You, get you do? I'm, I'm pretty much at the stage where I give everyone oral antibiotics after revision if the cultures are negative then I stop them. If they're positive, then I extend them. We used to do a, uh, you know, IV pick line for high risk people, but some of the complications that you can get with pick lines are, are pretty horrible. And so, uh, we're studying and, uh, you know, transitioning towards oral antibiotics. There's, there's a big oral versus IV, uh, New England journal article that came out a few years ago. It, it was more on bone and joint infections, not prosthetic joint infections, but it showed that, you know, it, similar success rates. So, um, you know, I think for shoulder PGI, the data still is pending, but, um, that's where things are trending right now. I think, how about so what, you? So what's your, po what's your positive, what do you, what's your go-to for positive C acnes? So they go two weeks, two weeks later, they come back positive in five days. You're putting them on oral for six weeks. What are you using? I always put people on doxycycline if they can tolerate it. Um, my second line would be Augmentin. Uh, and then if they're positive, I just go for three to six months. Um, so that's my. But you don't go. You don't go back to IV, right, Jason? So if if a patient like John was saying has five out of five cultures at day number fifteen, do you then call them and say, "Hey, you know what? We need an IV line for a few weeks. I don't trust that toxicity will have enough bioavailability." Or how do you handle that? Yeah, ultimately, it is a discussion with our IV team who helps us a lot, but I've been pushing a lot to go towards uh, oral. But if they don't have a lot of clinical symptoms, even if they have multiple positive cultures, I'm still pushing a lot to do oral and not IV. It's so hard. A lot of these patients are coming, like you are coming from hours away, and setting up a pick line from someone that lives three hours away is, a, is very difficult. We have a question from the audience. Is anyone using MARS uh, MRI? I am not. 
Is anybody using bone scans or anything anything else like that? I am not. No. Maybe we should. <laughs> One uh, other interesting thought, Jason, is that in your paper, you know, there were just a few uh, positives in the controls, and they all three came from two centers. So just imagine if a paper had not included those two centers, you would have a zero percent positive. Mm -hmm. In the so it goes to tell you that these studies are difficult to interpret based on the sample size, right? Because a little change in the number of centers that contribute could take you from fourteen percent to zero. Absolutely, and I think that's uh, one of the points I said is that you should talk with your lab and maybe do. You know, we did a, a test of fifty negative controls to see what our negative or our false positive rate is, and I don't know if everyone has the resources to do that, but it'd be interesting to know at your institution and everyone's institution, like how, how much can you trust your lab to not contaminate the sample or um, get positive results from uh, things that you're not intending to be positive, I guess. So, I mean, um, which is, which is fine if you, have, if you have multiple specimens, but if you get one and you're in that 15 or 20%, you know, what do you do with that? You know, that, that's, that's always my concern with an aspiration is that if there is a false positivity rate in your institution, then, you know, you're a one in five chance of hitting it. I, I think that is important why you should look at the sum at quantitative culture, because if it is stronger positivity, that I don't think is a, is a false yeah. positive. Yeah. Now we got one more question before we move in. This is from our good friend, Kate Fedorka. Kate, I, ha I hate you for asking this because I can't pronounce this word, but we'll do it anyway. Anyone utilizing Dalvabansin infusions, two infusions a week apart, and the infusion center, if positive, has been shown to work against C acne. Is it, are any of the panelists using this strange word infusion? They have not. And, you know, Kate is such a, in a good way, uh, such a nerd. <laughs> she knows everything. So I have never oh, heard nerd. of it. You're incredible. You always know things that I don't know. So I, I've never heard of it. That's awesome. Uh, we'll move on to the next one uh, now, which. Okay, so this next article, hot off the press, a special thanks to the ASCS um, complications group to allow us to present their uh, chromium stress fracture complication paper, which um, is amazing data. It's coming out in JBJS soon. So um, this study aimed to identify implant positioning parameters and factors contributing to chromial stress fractures and scapular spine fractures following reverse shoulder arthroplasty. It was a multi-center retrospective study of patients who underwent RSAs from 2013 to 2019 with a minimum of three-month follow-up. Studies included uh, 24 AS surgeons, uh, 15 institutions. So they use a multivariable regress logistic regression, identify factors linked to chromium stress fracture and scapular spine fractures. Radiographic data included lateralization shoulder angle, distalization shoulder angle, and lateral humeral offset were collecting a two to one cohort to fracture ratio analyzed separately uh, to evaluate their association. They had over 6,000 patients. Overall stress, stress fracture rate was 3.8%, 2.9% in the chromium stress fracture group, 0.9% in the scapular spine fracture group. The chromium stress fracture risk factors included inflammatory arthritis, massive rotator cuff tears, osteoporosis, prior shoulder surgery, cuff tear arthropathy, female sex, increasing age, and greater total glenoid lateral offset. Revision surgery was associated with reduced acromious stress fracture risk. Scapular spine fracture risks included female sex, rotator cuff disease, osteoporosis, and inflammatory arthritis. Radiographic analysis and matched patients found a higher change in lateralization shoulder angle and post-operative lateralization shoulder angle increased stress fracture risk which increased lateral humeral offset, uh, and sorry, while increased lateral humeral offset reduced the risk. Distalization showed no significant association with stress fracture incidence. So they conclude that patient factors associated with poor bone density and rotator cuff deficiency appear to be the strongest predictors of chromium stress fractures after RSA. Final implant positioning to a lesser degree may also affect the chromium stress fracture incident at at-risk patients, as increased humeral lateralization was found to be associated with lower fracture rates, whereas excessive glenoid-sided and global lateralization were associated with higher uh, fracture rates. So, Dr. Levy, you uh, you were influential in the study. Maybe we could just get some general commentary from you first. Yeah. So, I mean, this was this was a very very 
a challenging study, to be honest. And and I give huge props to, to Andy Jawa, who was able to navigate through this entire process. He did a phenomenal job. Um, you know, a lot of the initial findings, the, the probably the strongest odds ratios, if you look at the risk factors, there are things that we've talked about before, osteoporosis, female sex, cuff deficiency. So those weren't the, you know, that, that data with such a large cohort really just reinforced some of the things we found. But this was the first to actually look at implants and the position at which you put the implants in. And originally, and this didn't, this originally, there was discussion around the actual design philosophy themselves. And, and I had a personal huge issue with that because I've used the same design philosophy for my entire career when I used it in a situation where I lateralized on the glenoid and didn't quite use the right technique that I do today. And I lateralized on the humerus, meaning I added, I kind of created almost like an onlay system. My of chromium fracture rate was 12, 13%. We published on it. And then when I switched and I cr created more of an inlay, so I didn't lateralize on the humerus, but I still lateralized on the glenoid, it was down to 4%. And so the design philosophy to me wasn't the, the, the problem, it was the position. And that's where the radiographic analysis came through. And so I think the radiographic analysis teaches you that too much lateralization can be a bad thing, but it's global lateralization. It's a lateral lateral. Like if you lateralize on the glenoid and lateralize on the humerus, I think you create a problem. And we've seen that. And, and even, even the Tournier experience identified that same problem uh, when they compared that to the historical Grammont design and saw a much higher rate of, of scapular spine fractures. So I think that that's the take home from the radiographic analysis is it's not always just about the implant use. It's, it's how you use them and where the final position of the implant is. You take these tiny little patients who are the highest at risk, small, female, osteoporotic, and you put in these implants that over lateralize from where they started. You're just asking for an acromion stress fracture. And this study helps you to understand that. That's, that's fantastic. Um, so, so uh, Jason, do you want to uh, sort of expand upon that? What, what are some of these... Um, technical considerations that you are, that maybe you've learned um, that uh, have helped to uh, decrease or lower your, your coronal stress fracture rate. So, you know, Levy mentioned don't over lateralize, especially the high risk patients, older osteoporotic patients with globalization. What are other things that you think about um, and you've maybe changed or, or, or approach, approach some of these high risk patients with? Yeah, yeah. Well, I've learned a lot from Levy himself. So I, I agree, not too much global lateralization. So especially in the, the smaller patients, I'm going with the smallest size as possible. And I'm also thinking not just about fracture risk, but also um, impingement free range of motion, because I think there is some relationship there. I think if you you have to have enough distalization for impingement free range of motion, I'm, I'm specifically talking about abduction impingement where the arm is up and the tuberosity is hitting the acromion. And so I think that was sort of an unrecognized potential uh, cause for uh, stress fractures. And so my current thought is that yeah. I try to put, again, it's where you put the implant within the humerus. And I, I try to put the implant as lateral as possible within the humerus to decrease the global lateralization and increase the amount of humerus that can clear underneath the acromion. And so I do as much as I can to dislize to get it free under the acromion, but not too distal. So it's a lot of intraoperative playing. I trial every single time and I test it out. And I I, I use a um, constrained liner in almost all the cases because I want to make sure that this humerus clears under the uh, acromion. And, uh, and so I'll also do a tuberoplasty to try to, it's the lateral part of the, the greater tuberosity where I'll kind of just Spur that down. Sometimes it's a lesser as well, but all these uh, things. I think it's you know I put the glance here a little bit lower than most just so I can get some clearance. And then um, you know, luckily, knock on wood, my fracture rate isn't isn't very high uh, with that approach. Um, I wouldn't say it's the most scientific. I don't pre-op plan probably as much as John does, but I think with the approach of trialing and making sure that you have clearance, then uh, it's acceptable. Okay. And I actually think what, what one of the things that uh, we, we, we published a paper that probably got unnoticed and it looked at radiographic factors that were associated with acromion stress fractures. We didn't find any any observations. But when when I published it, Rick Matson emails me immediately and he says, I want you to look at your distalization numbers, meaning your, your post-op distalization and see, do you have a two shape, like a double bell curve, meaning 
do you have a population who got a chromium fracture who were under lengthened and a population that was over lengthened? And we started to plot it out and it was starting to look like it. We didn't have the numbers to answer it, but it was starting to plot out a little bit. And I think that's true. It's getting to what Jason was referring to. You can under distalize, meaning you put it too high and you impinge and you create an acromion fracture from impingement, or you can just go too long and going too long puts too much tension and you get tension side of acromion fractures. So it's the Goldilocks phenomenon where you have to just sort of find that just right position. You can get, you can understand it a whole lot better if you virtually plan. So I, I definitely am a huge proponent. It's very interesting though, because originally like, 10, 15 years ago, we always thought, you know, if you dislice too much, you're pulling on the deltoid too much. And, but there's many studies that have really, and I think this is one of them where distalization isn't really shown to really be a, a risk factor. So it's a very complex thing, but I, I think just like John said, if you have to be just right, you can't be too high. You can't be too low. We have a question from Pete McDonald. Thanks Pete for showing up to this uh, webinar. He said, uh, did you all look at the acromial thickness as a variable? Many are thinned out as a result of CTA. John, did you guys look at that? Or do you look at your previous work? So the, the, we, we, we did not look at it in this study. Um, I, I, to be honest, I think it's kind of hard to truly measure that on radiographs because it really, you have to get the perfect, the perfect view in order to really assess that. Um, Gus Mazaka and I did a, we published a, a paper that looked at the, Something similar. We looked at actually, we took measurements of the lateral acromion, the midacromion, and the most medial portion of the acromion, and it created a ratio. And if 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 you sort of have a high ratio, meaning it's really thin medial and it's really thick and, and wide laterally, you had a much higher rate and predictability predictability for for fractures. That's the closest that we've done. But it's not looking at the thinning out of the acromion. And to be honest, I don't know that the thinning out uh, maybe a lateral a fracture is more at risk if it's thin out. But the ones we're worrying about are the one are the more medial fractures anyway. And you can have a thinned out acromion, you still fracture medially, you know? So it's not, I don't know what to make of just a thinned out acromion. We used to think, oh, people at subacromial decompressions are at greater risk for acromion fractures. Shoot, I'd love it to happen there. If acromion fractures only occurred where I did a subacromial decompression, we would have no problems at all and patients would be fine. Can I make a comment, uh, Eric and Chris? Yeah, please. So this paper is so interesting to me, and I really commend the author because it's so hard to do this, but there are two things that I don't really get. Um, if you read the paper um, in detail, when they describe the measurements on x-rays, uh, they talk about the lateralization and distalization shoulder angles, which we all understand, and also a method to measure lateral humeral offset or humeral lateralization. But nowhere in the paper states how is total glenoid lateral offset measured. Like I haven't seen it in the paper. But in the abstract, they say that that's one of the risk factors for the fracture to occur. So uh, that's interesting to me that I couldn't find a description of how that was measured. And I'm making the point okay. because of the following reason. If you measure an angle, it's really useful because you are already, to some extent, compensating for the patient size or the exit magnification. If you measure a distance, it has to do with how big the patient is and the exit magnification. So lateralizing, let's say, six millimeters in a very small patient is not the same as in a very big patient. Number two, the way that the humeral lateralization was measured was from the pivot point to the center of the diaphysis. But if the tuberosity is large in a bigger patient, the deltoid is going to be more lateral in that bigger patient with the centralization. So I'm a little bit concerned because if you read this paper, you could think what we are all doing today, because I think that most of us are maximally lateralizing on the glenoid and using an inlay design. This paper tells you if you do that, you will have the highest fracture rate. So I want to be careful of how people interpret this data because I haven't seen that measurement in the paper, and I wonder if that should be requested from the authors. Nowhere they describe how that was measured. And uh, it has an odds ratio of 1.5, which is not high, but the p-value is significant. If, if I remember correctly, it was a distance from the glenoid to the lateral most point of the glenoid component. Would be so if you did a bio, if you did a bio RSA and you used a large sear, you could get pretty, you could get well past. But the, yeah, I don't see the paper. Maybe I missed it. Did you guys see it anywhere in the paper? Describe how they measured total glenoid lateral offset. I didn't see it. 
It wasn't, so there was a separate radiographic analysis. This, that was not part of the radiographic analysis. But I think it came from the survey from the, from each of the centers like us. We, we wrote, okay, I didn't use any, I didn't use a bio-RSA. I used a 32 neutral. Therefore, it was 10 plus 16 is 26. You know, it was 26 is that number. As my second concern is that if that value is derived on the manufacturer specifications, we right. all know that if you read more bone graft, you're going to change that dramatically. For example, you can have a very lateralized sphere. If you read a centimeter, that is yeah, exactly changing. So the, it should be clarified if that measurement is based on manufacturer specifications as opposed to how it came out on X-rays, because the message that this paper sends is completely opposite to most people talking from the podium today. Do you, do you agree, John? Like looking at this, you will I, say, well, the you know the VJO or the uh, you know or the new striker perform. That's what they do. They lateralize on the glenoid. Yeah, and I, lateralize on the but I think you're 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 taking two different data sets. There's two really. There, this is two studies within one. This is a survey of of you know ASCS members, and then it's a subgroup of a hundred patients they did a radiographic analysis of. So it's not a radiographic analysis of the entire cohort. That would have been exhaustive. We didn't do that. So it was a an attempt to try to understand the final positioning of some of them. And that that's actually my, you know, my internal criticism of the paper is, you know, we'd, it'd be nice to have x-ray measurements, radiographic measurements on every single paper, every single patient included. But that's not that's not what happened. But in the paper, they said that they did measure the angle in every patient that fractured. And they were matched. Yes, but then that... Two to one for, match to a smaller, but I don't think they measured Glen lateralization. I think they, that came from the manufacturer. So this paper has yeah, to that's because that's on the that's on the other part of the analysis. That's on the that's not on the radiographic analysis. That's why the the results have to be taken with a grain of salt. In my opinion, even though the paper is extremely well done. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. Um, the, the leave us then Joaquin, in addition to some of the considerations, the globalization, what, what's something else, you know, we just talked about dislocation risks, um, maybe leaving it too loose, um, so, certain factors, increasing dislocation risks. Now we're talking about chromal stress risk, you leave it too tight. How, how do you get that magic tension? How do you get that magic clearance? How do you get that magic combination of, of medialization on the humerus, lateralization on the glenoid? What's, what's your, what's a trick for us, for us to work on the next paper? I wish I knew. I, I don't think I know the answer to that, Eric. I think we all try to get them stable in the OR and be careful with soft tissue tension in patients that have risk factors, but I don't think they have a magic formula, you know. Um, in general, for me, stability trumps everything. So if I feel that the patient is going to dislocate, I'm going to make it tighter. Maybe I will pay the price later. And I think what Jason mentioned is important. And the first person that taught that to me was John Levy, actually. Uh, he told me about how sometimes the GT can impact on the acromion, and I wasn't aware of that, so I think that's very important too. Uh, one thing I will do with virtual planning is I will always make sure that I'm not lateralizing the final position of the humerus beyond where the patient started, right? So you can you, most of the software allows you to see where the final product is and compare it to the scan pose, let's just say, where the patient was scanned at. I don't want to be more lateral than that because I think if you get – into that situation, you're definitely going to be over lateralizing. It's just a, it's a quick way to kind of anticipate those potential problems. And then a chromium impingement is certainly something I, I my goalpost, I say goalpost because we don't know how much you actually need to be safe, but I want to get at least 70 degrees of motion without hitting. That's my goalpost, but I don't have any science behind that. I would love for someone to give me that science. And John, in a patient that has severe preoperative medial glenoid bone loss, that patient is on yeah. medial that if you get them to not lateralize in based on morbid anatomy, you will be a still medial to the normal shoulder. Do you worry that then they are unstable? Only if they're cuff deficient. If their cuff is intact and they medialized or they have enough of their cuff and they have an internal splint, then I never care. If they are, you know, if they're inverted, meaning the acromion is more lateral than the final position of the grade two porosity, yeah, and they're cuff deficient, then I do have potential issues there. And I will try to, I mean, that's where I'm going with larger spheres. I'm trying to find ways of creating stability with other means other than just lengthening and lateralizing. That's, that's fantastic. All right, let's go on to the last one just so we can cover it. This was a great discussion. So last one's a revision for a, a reverse for base pay players by Frankel's group in Tampa. A very relevant topic, obviously. Uh, revision for base pay failures or reverses is something that I think that's coming down. The massive amount of reverses are going in. You know, 2015 was the first year that we had 
um, more versus the atomics, and now it's almost double, triple, or even quadrupled in amount. And so this is going to be very relevant that we're going to be seeing this more and more. Um, so the purpose of this report on the prevalence, causes, and outcomes of revision. Um, this was a retrospective review, actually, of 46 that were revised for base pay player out of uh, 667 screened. Um, the uh, ultimate the ultimate clinical outcomes of the revisions of, for the base player was failure was an ACS score of, of 62 at both one and two years seemed to be consistent. Um, and then ultimately they had three, so 6.5% that required a repeat revision for base plate failure after the original one. Um, one, two for PGIs and one for traumatic failure. And then um, they did have another five reoperations and 13 overall complications. The reoperations were for humeral leucine, periprostatic fracture, glenoid dissociation, graft screw removal, and a component retention. So there was a fairly high rate of reoperations, as you can imagine, this complex group of patients. Interesting enough, none of the, nothing they looked at uh, showed a difference in, in patient blocker measures, revision, or complications. When looking at failure modes, prior revisions, prior surgeries, many other factors that, that we have, would have assumed. Um, and interesting also, when you look at some of the prior data, including many people on this panel that have published in the revision of anatomics, actually very similar overall outcome to the card revision at rates and reparations. So, um, you know, great large retrospective review, you know, revision reverse is one of the more challenging things I think we deal with, especially particularly when it's a base weight failure and the associated problems with that. You know, this just highlights the difficulty of this, highlights the high reoperation rates, high, but also highlights that there is some promise in getting a stable base plate eventually. So um, kind of starting this out, um, so uh, Joaquin, what in your mind are, are are some of the technical tips for a fellow starting out to avoid base plate failure? So what is the main thing that you're like, all right, this is this base plate failed because of this reason. And then how can you advise the fellows are, that are listening in um, to avoid that? Before we go into that, Eric, I was going to make also a comment. Oh, please, 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 please. The paper, you know, I yes. think they should have entitled this paper differently because when you read the title, it makes you think that they analyzed 676. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, Mark. Oh my goodness. And then you realize that it's actually 46. You know, you, they start basically. And then of those 46, 11 were never really followed more than six yeah. months. Yeah. So we only know the outcome of 32 patients. That's important for the fellows to know. <laughs> not 700. It's not even 46. It's actually 32. Having settled that is an amazing study. <laughs> and, 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 I, and to that point, to, to that point, Joaquin. I mean, to me, you're not out of the you're not out of the gate. You're not out of the woods until you're probably two years out. I Meaning, you you could have such great fixation without ingrowth, and then it eventually fails two years later. So, you know, I think you're. This is where two year minimum follow up. I think matters. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think, you know, for the fellows in the uh, journal club, it's important to also look at the papers because you read very quickly the abstract. It's like, oh, my God, I know that if you revise 700 cases, you get a 6% failure rate. Well, no. If you follow 32 <laughs> of these patients, that's what you find. But having said that, Eric, I think the most important factors to consider, in my opinion, are primary implant stability, enough surface for ingrowth, and avoiding superior tilt. I think those are the main things. And probably the first two are more important, the third maybe a little bit less. Um, as you know, conceptually you can classify base plates in the ones that have ingrowth only on the back surface, or the ones that have a little bit of ingrowth that goes into the bolt in the form of either a boss or a post or a combo, you know. So for me, um, if a patient has outstanding bone quality, then I think you can get primary ingrowth in almost every patient with an uh implant that only has ingrowth on the base, but if a patient has had radiation therapy or is very frail or osteoporosis, then maybe using an involved fixation design is better. So I use both depending on the patient. And I think you want to finish your fixation and knowing that you have rock solid fixation based on press fit of your post, if that's what you use, or a screw fixation. You know, Mark Frankel has shown that to us for, for years, that if you get that tactile feedback with the DGO prosthesis, you're, you're good. Then finally, even if you get great fixation, you know, superior tilt is constantly stressing the fixation. And especially in the revision setting, like John said, you may be cheering yourself for two years and then your number three, boom, it dislodges. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Levy, sort of, do you want to expand upon that? So uh, certain things that you are 
worried about if you see on a post-op x-ray or um you know having used a different maybe a different system what is your uh what are things that you are uh, advising fellows to avoid and how are you maximizing sort of the long-term fixation of, of the of the base plate anything to add beyond what wilkinson yeah i mean I, I think first of all the tools we have today compared to the tools we had even five or ten years ago is just dramatic and so i think the this is a very focused area for innovation um Things that I use routinely when I'm reviving failed glenoids, and I would include anatomics and reverses in this in this sentence. I often will use off-label use of bone morphogenic, you know, BMP. Um, I use infuse is the one I use most commonly, and I'll layer it. I'll cut it in pieces and put it in different places around the fixation because um, I need bone growth is the game. And if you don't get it, you'll start to see early radiolucent lines. And once you see a shift in position, that thing is go, it's failing and it, it's just a matter of time. So, um, you know, follow your patients closely. I don't let these patients disappear. I really impress upon them the importance of getting x-ray and not overdoing their, like not straining their fixation until I know it's been long enough that they've gotten ingrowth. And I think a lot of patients uh, will start to push it a little bit three or four months in because they think they're out of the, you know, out of the woods and they're not. Um, I use medialized center rotation glenospheres I use glenospheres that have um, lips that allow me to load share. So it's not just the base plate getting the fixation, but the glenosphere itself that gets rim contact on the bone around it to unload some of the stress and strain off of that primary fixation. So I think these are all, you know, lots of tricks, lots of techniques, lots of new innovations, but I think the game changing effort is all focused on bony ingrowth and prosthesis. Wonderful. Jason, can you add some more text when you're revising a, in, in this case, you're revising a failed, when I reverse or anatomic, you have compromised bone stock. What, what are some other things that you're doing to uh, to get really nice stability before you leave the R? Yeah, um, I said I, I only wrote one note about this paper, and it was three things for fellows to consider, and they're exactly the same as what Kane. So initial fixation with the central part of your base plate, biomechanical stability, both of either graft or bone, and find, you have to make sure you get good compression and long-term incorporation of that entire construct to the scapula. So. That includes both the back side of the base plate and the central fixation that you're getting. Um, things that I've learned is that, uh, you know, I, I use a, a monoblock central screw base plate, and I think the fixation, you have to get good bite immediately so that you can compress that base plate down. And so, um, you know, I, I love the alternate center line, you know, just introverting and doing a little inferior tilt. If you really get good bone there and you can compress down uh, that gets you really good initial fixation. And then after that, you have to make sure that whether you're using bone graft or you, you're on native bone, that you know you get great compression there. I'm a big fan of using iliac crest just because I trust the patient's own bone and I think it's better than allograft. I know it's you know more surgery, but I've always been a fan of autograft or over allograft whenever I can use it. So um, I think alternate center line, getting good compression, and then I, I use autograft. Wonderful. Joaquin, so Todd, can you just uh, help us understand? So we've heard Ilya Crest, we've heard actually Levy talking about BMP. Um, how do you decide when you're going to use a bone graft, autograft versus allograft? And, um, you know, when you have the really deficient, maybe uncontained defects, what, what do you, what are you, how are you uh, solving that riddle? Yeah, I'm, I'm like Jason. I want to see uh, autograft behind an ingrowth prosthesis. So that's my go-to. For a contained cavitary defect, I think the distal clavicle is wonderful. I mean, it just fits. So that's my go-to in a patient that has adequate anterior and posterior walls, and the size of the clavicle typically fits perfectly there. For a patient that is missing one wall or both walls, if I'm going to be using bone graft as opposed to a custom prosthesis, then I would use also iliac crest myself. But, you know, Pascal Balog has been using uh, allograft femoral health for years, and I read in the paper by Mark, like John mentioned also, using BMP, which I've never tried. So I'm sure there is multiple ways to skin the cat. It's just that for me, there is so much um, at stake, right? You're doing a revision of a reverse to reverse. You want that to work. Uh, so I'm willing to throw the kitchen sink at that patient because if it fails again, I don't know what, what I'm going to do next. So I'm biased in favor of more autograft in general. Anybody have any any last tips for revising these difficult uh, processes? Perfect. Well, it's nine o'clock. Um, I think we're going to end this up. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, wonderful questions. Uh, amazing work, panel. We really appreciate it. This was one of the best ones we've had by far. 
Um, really, really appreciate all your insight into this. Um, uh, those of you who um, uh, want to see some of the prior recordings, please go to the uh, the ASCS website. They all these are are posted previous from previous years, including some similar discussions in, in past years and similar topics. So, thank you all very much. Thank you for spending the your Tuesday evening with us, Chris. Anything you want to leave? No, and this is now available on the ASCS app too. So. Um, please download the app. Uh, it's super helpful for us to get sponsorship and they're all on the front page. So we all appreciate you joining us. And as, as always, Eric, great job. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Well done.